Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Oxford and Cambridge Society Malaysia's first webinar. We are thrilled to have you all here. Um, if you join us a little bit later on, it doesn't matter. We will be um, recording this and putting it on our new YouTube channel so you can um, share it with people later. Uh, before we start tonight, I just wanted to let you know some of the other webinars that we've got coming up in the next couple of weeks. On Wednesday, we have Dr. Ushirani George and Dr. Tan Lian Kwat from Sunway Medical Center. Obviously, they're going to be talking about COVID-19, um, and that's at 8 p.m. On Friday, the 24th of April, we have um, a partner from EY, uh, George Koshi, and he'll be talking to us about um, exit strategies coming out of the MCO lifting. That one's at 4.30. And then on the 29th, um, Wednesday, the 29th of April, 8 p.m., we have Dr. We have, sorry, Professor Asli Rahman. Um, that one's at 8 p.m. because he's actually teaching in New York at the moment, where he's in lockdown. So um, we're trying to find a time when everybody's kind of awake and um, he's not teaching um, at the university at that time. And we do have a few others in the pipeline, so keep checking your emails. Um, you will see we've uh, launched our own YouTube channel and um, we're working with Kumas and OUMC to put on lots of student videos. Um, our event videos will also go on our new YouTube channel and we've got lots of interesting um, interviews of different people about well-being and staying well and um, healthy during the MCO. Um, finally, some of you have already said that you would like to be judges for our competition. Uh, which is the academic enrichment competition while the students are on the um, on the MCO lockdown. So thank you for those. If you're interested in being a judge for the competition or you know somebody who would like to enter the competition, please let me know and I will send you all the details. That's fantastic. All right, so let's move on with our first webinar and our interview. Your moderator this evening is Mr. Mark Disney. You all know him very well. Um, and our first guest, uh, we are thrilled um, for a second time, we are going to be speaking to um, Professor Jomo Swami Sundaran. Um, he studied at the Penang Free School and then Royal Military College, and then he went to Yale, and then he went to Harvard. Many of us know him as the um, economist, professor, and he was the UN Assistant Secretary General for 10 years, starting in 2005. He's spoken to us before, always extremely enlightening. Um, we've had chats with him before about this, and uh, I'm sure tonight we're going to have a really interesting conversation with him. If you'd like to ask him some questions, you can post them in the chat on um, the YouTube channel. Um, Balraj and myself will be looking at those questions and then sending them over to um, um, Prof. Jomo and Mark. So um, please type any questions at any point that you want, um, and we'll forward those on. All right, so I'm going to pass over to uh, Mark and Prof. Jomo. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much indeed, Emma. Um, it's a, a great effort for everyone to get this uh, organized at such short notice. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm hoping you've all just finished your uh, dinner. Um, Dr. Jomo, um, thanks a lot for your time. Um, it's, uh, it, it's really good that you're um, uh, making a real effort to kind of start communicating uh, with people out there. Um, for those of you listening into uh, YouTube, please uh, post your questions. Um, we'll read them out and we will, in real time, uh, get Prof to answer uh, the questions. So I think we have about 30 minutes, 35 minutes uh, to go through some of the big issues that are, are facing us, um, following which we will move into a, a Q&A. We may get questions uh, coming in, but we'll deal with those as they appear. So, um, uh, Prof, good evening. Good evening, Mark. Okay. Uh, I apologize for calling you Prof. Uh, you know that's a reflex. Uh, <laughs> Prof Jomo is no longer a, a technically a professor at University of Malaya and so on, uh, and he's asked us to, but, uh, to, to not use that name, but t take it as a kind of, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a simple epithet. Um, uh, uh, that's what people think of you as. Um, so if we could kick off then, um, we, we were looking at a few questions, um, can I, uh, looking at the economic effects or the ec economic impact of um, uh, COVID-19, the lockdown, the world economy grinding seemingly to a halt, but presumably not to a halt. Um, to start with, could we maybe 
uh, get your views on, on, in terms of putting things into perspective, that the global response has been incredibly varied. It's varied from country to country. Um, uh, developed countries have, have responded differently uh, with seemingly very varied results. Um, as far as you're concerned, which countries do you think have handled this well and which haven't, and, and perhaps why? Thank you, Mark, and, and thanks to Emma and the rest of the team for organizing this. Uh, let me um, uh, make a number of distinctions. I think it's very important for us to distinguish between the uh, public health response and the uh, other responses, particularly the economic response for the purposes of discussion tonight. I think from the public health point of view, uh, what, is, what is, is quite clear is that early action made a huge difference. Uh, and we see that particularly in East Asia, but also in places like Kapila State in, in India, uh, we have seen early responses which have been very, very successful, generally speaking. There have been some important setbacks. And uh, the, what's happening in Singapore right now, for example, is particularly worrisome uh, because it suggests that the early response, which seemed to be succeeding, uh, has not to, been too successful uh, because it largely omitted looking at the uh, condition of the migrant workers. And the migrant workers are the major source of the new infections. In other words, migrant workers were largely left out of policy making. Uh, initially and largely left out of the testing. And so there, and, and now we've, we've seen a huge spike in Singapore, mainly due to the migrant workers. But by and large, I think um, uh, the, what we also see is a, a huge mistake on the part of the provincial authorities uh, in, uh, or the city authorities in Wuhan uh, city where the outbreak began. And the um, local authorities tried to suppress information. And I suspect that that probably delayed action for quite a, quite a bit of time, uh, possibly a, a couple of weeks at least, possibly slightly more. Uh, but all this basically uh, was time lost and during which time there was a tremendous spread of the virus. So when the uh, central authorities in China intervened, they took a completely different approach to the local authorities. They became uh, transparent. They tried to inform everybody else whom they saw as uh, possible stakeholders in this. They were cooperative with many other governments in the region. Uh, in the case of neighboring Vietnam, for example, uh, they were informed of what had happened uh, as late as early as uh, December last year. Uh, this All this is important for us to go through because, uh, as you know, there are a number of conspiracy theories right now uh, which are going around. And these conspiracy theories, uh, one set of theories uh, chooses to blame China as behind uh, the entire uh, crisis as a chance for China to, to ascend in the, in, in the world order. And, another, and related to that is uh, blaming the WHO. Uh, in fact, uh, most of these are wrong, but the problem with the uh, conspiracy theories is that they are almost impossible to disprove conclusive because of the very nature of conspiracy mm -hmm. theories. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the Asian response was not matched in other parts of the world, um, and we do not, did not see uh, early uh, action in many other parts of the world. Uh, there is also the possibility that the strain of the virus uh, in other parts of the world have been different. Uh, it has been suggested that the, the strain A, uh, according to some recent Cambridge researchers, uh, which was in the United States, uh, has, not been, uh, has not been as lethal uh, as strains B and C. Uh, strain C, which seems to be the uh, strain to be found in it, in Italy, and interestingly enough, Singapore uh, seems to be uh, the most lethal of the three strains. Uh, but we can't necessarily explain away the uh, the infectiousness uh, or what uh, what epidemiologists would call morbidity, uh, as well as mortality, simply in terms of the strains. There are other factors at work, uh, including preparedness. But what 
we, we find and particularly commendable is uh, the way in which Korea uh, and uh, Taiwan pr province of China have responded. Uh, in the case of Korea, uh, there was a very serious outbreak in Daegu City uh, due to uh, basically a, a secretive religious cult, uh, which allowed uh, the, 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 the uh, virus to spread. And um, they uh, Korea has managed to bring the whole, um, uh, the, the rate uh, of infection under control, uh, reduce the, the rate to levels, uh, relatively low levels fairly early on, uh, without, uh, with very little uh, intrusion, uh, very little disruption, but a high level of testing. So testing, testing, testing was, the, was basically the motto you could attribute to the Korean approach. Uh, in the case of uh, Taiwan, because there was no comparable uh, incident uh, to Daegu, uh, Taiwan has a, a very commendably low uh, rate of infection and certainly low rate of, of death associated with infection. Um, now, if, for relatively poor societies such as uh, Kerala and Vietnam, uh, the, their achievements are also very, very con uh, uh, commendable. Uh, they have been able to keep the rate of infection down. Um, uh, and uh, through relatively low cost measures, uh, uh, Vietnam has spent much more than, than Kerala has, uh, but uh, these measures are very commendable. In the rest of the world, unfortunately, particularly in the two major Anglophone countries, the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, there were very delayed responses. Uh, for different reasons. Uh, the, we all uh, are familiar with what happened in the United States, but in the case of the United Kingdom, the early thinking was that uh, that the, we, we sh the, the, the UK would wait for herd immunity to develop. And only with the publication of the Imperial College of London study in middle of uh, March la uh, last month, uh, we find that the, the UK government uh, changed tack and took a much more, uh, uh, a, a stronger approach. But by the time, of course, uh, the, 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 the infections had spread throughout, uh, throughout, through much of the population, and it became necessary to take uh, lockdown measures. So we should recognize lockdown measures for what they are. They are usually relatively blunt instruments. They are usually uh, late uh, uh, measures. Uh, uh, and because of the failure or the uh, inattention to early action measures. So we have th those kinds of differences. On the economic side, I think it's important to distinguish between the uh, various efforts in different countries to try to ameliorate, uh, to try to mitigate some of the consequences of lockdowns. Uh, it is also important to recognize that even in China, uh, there were very, very different approaches to lockdown. Uh, lockdowns were particularly important in Wuhan and the three provinces around Wuhan, but for the remaining 20 provinces of China, there were in effect no lockdowns after the Lunar New Year holiday. The Lunar New Year holiday was unusually extended from one week to two weeks, but beyond that, there were a lot of the other types of early action measures, but not really a lockdown. So it's really quite misleading to suggest that lockdowns are, are the only possible way of dealing with these problems. If you have early action, uh, you are able to, to, to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. Now, the current thinking is that in the absence of a vaccine, in the absence of a proven cure, uh, it becomes important to try to what is called flatten the curve. And this refers to the ability of national health systems to cope with new infections. So the idea is to try to ensure that the, that the, the, the rate of new infections is below the, the maximum level a national system can cope with. Um, the, possibility, the likelihood of completely uh, eliminating uh, infections is considered generally uh, believed to be relatively low, especially for open societies open economies uh, such as Malaysia. And uh, so it, uh, this is not really uh, a, a feasible target as such. But nonetheless, the idea is to bring down the rate of infections so that they can be handled by the, by the, um, the, the health systems. 
until such time that cures and more importantly, vaccines become available. But we know how long it took, for example, for the smallpox vaccine to become uh, globally available or the, or the polio vaccine. Now, in both those cases, they were basically public goods. But much of the current research is being done by private companies who may well try to make a fast, a quick buck from the, uh, from the intellectual property rights uh, they are going to assert uh, in relation to these vaccines. So these are some of the concerns which I have. But it's important to recognize that in almost all societies, there have been efforts to try to mitigate uh, some of the consequences of the crisis economically. In Kerala in particular, I think it's very, very commendable that they have really uh, taken a bottoms up approach, a bottom up approach in the sense that they have focused on the most vulnerable people in their societies rather than uh, focus on the usual suspectively easy to see uh, people, people such as the um, uh, how, how should I refer to them? Uh, you know, companies and uh -huh. people who usually walk in the corridors of power. So in Kerala, uh, there's been particular attention to those who are self-employed and who are no longer able to, to, to earn a living because, because they are no longer allowed to, to ply their trades. Uh, 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 and in, in Malaysia, for example, about about a fifth of the population, at least a fifth of the population, are, are self-employed and vulnerable to very significant uh, uh, diminution, in the in, diminution in the incomes, if not elimination of the incomes. The other, of course, who are especially vulnerable, are um, referred to internationally as casual labor, in, uh, informal sector workers, and so on. Uh, in Malaysia, we often refer to them as daily rated workers. So no work, no pay, no income, uh, no, no livelihood, and they are also very, very vulnerable. Uh, to begin with, even before this uh, lockdown, they have uh, already been living uh, hand to mouth, so to speak. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, this is going to be devastating, particularly for the businesses. I am particularly concerned that by the time the lockdown ends, uh, it will be almost the beginning of the of the of the fasting Muslim fasting month. And this will mean that the likelihood of, uh, for example, uh, reopening businesses which cater for the lunch uh, meal uh, is going to be diminished for many of these people. So we are going to see a fairly significant uh, disruption of incomes, which are going to go beyond uh, those uh, six weeks of the, of the lockdown. Uh, beyond that, of course, um, what is di distinct about uh, this particular is that it is not uh, a demand side crisis. Um, you know, uh, uh, Keynes uh, redefined economics and talked about the problems of aggregate demand collapsing and so on and so forth. But in this particular case, uh, what we see is that uh, work who want to work, uh, and others who want to produce, who want to produce economically relevant, uh, eco economically needed services are not able to do so because of the circumstances of the lockdown. So for them, um, uh, the, uh, you know, um, the, the, the ability to continue to, 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 to provide such services and, and goods uh, is going to be uh, reduced by the fact that because of lower incomes, you're going to have less aggregate demand as well. And on the other hand, many of them will not be able to, to resume the kinds of work activities which have been generating incomes for them. So this is, uh, so there are, you know, I think I, I certainly don't want to get into the speculation of how much economies are going to collapse or how much economies are going to shrink, but the numbers are, are, are worrying. The numbers are almost changing by the week, if, if not by the month. Yeah. This, this prof, this is the point, isn't it? That the numbers are changing um, weekly, and I think for casual observers, uh, you know, people like us, you know, we're, we're following it. So many of the things that you you say are based on the figures that we have, um, and, and there's a kind of a blizzard of of, of, of data coming out. I mean, I, I've been reading that the world economy continues to be one and two percent, which doesn't seem significant to me. I don't know if that is significant. Uh, from an economist's point of view, and you know, the same, the same with the uh, with, with numbers of uh, 
reported um, illnesses and, and how that converts into deaths. There are several measurements and so on. You know, as an economist, when you're trying to look through this a very complex set of data, what, what numbers do you think that we should be focused on? I'm talking about what you were just saying about the, um, about the disease itself, but also about the economic impact. What, 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 what are the numbers that people should be paying attention to? I frankly would not be overly focused on the uh, on the forecast for how much uh, economies are likely to uh, 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 to shrink and so on and so forth. I would particularly uh, be concerned about the ability of governments uh, to to contain the spread of the virus, to contain the spread of the infections, to bring down the rate of death, uh, and the the likelihood of them uh, 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 and the preparations they are making for the post-lockdown period in, and, 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 how, and how economic activity uh, may well resume uh, after the lockdown. That would be my, my, my main concern. And as you, as you uh, hinted in your original question, uh, there are a variety of responses all over the world. Uh, it's impossible to to have a one fits all kind of an approach for the reasons which we discussed. Uh, but this basically means that um, a lot of decisions are going to be made primarily at the national level, and it will be very important for us to bring a more uh, the the the, the uh, uh, people who are concerned about uh, the economy into the discussion. Um, the implication of the Imperial College of London uh, study is that this is essentially an epidemiological uh, issue. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so the focus is really on, on, on you know, morbidity and mortality and so on and so forth. There is very little attention. Uh, the, in fact, there's almost not, no attention given to the economic consequences. And this is where I think we, we need to broaden the discussion uh, beyond the focus on the epidemiological and the policing measures. Far too much attention to policing. Uh, you know, I would, for example, be more interested in policing resources being used for to help to trace the people who are who are who are infected. Uh, you, um, in Malaysia, for example, we often talk about the so-called tablik cluster, uh, where uh, about sixteen thousand people uh, are, are, are congregated uh, in 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 the Sri Petaling Mosque. Now, out of that tablet cluster, the, the, the impression one has is that well over 4,000 still have not even been traced. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and they are the ones who have been most responsible, not only for the infections in this country, but also in the rest of the region. If you look at the numbers in Brunei, in Singapore, in the southern part of the Philippines and in Indonesia, uh, they, they have been very, very important in, in, in spreading the virus in, in these areas. So we, we, we also need a tremendous public, uh, public, health, uh, public uh, health education effort because people are not going to, to people are going to reluctantly uh, uh, conform and, uh, if they are just told that you have to stay indoors and, and, and so on. But if they better understand what is at stake and why things are, are uh, 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 being asked of them, uh, I, I suspect that you will have a far greater um, res response from the public uh, who, are, who are likely to respond. I think it is wrong uh, to say that people of faith, uh, people who are religiously inclined, uh, are going to re uh, uh, reject all this. Uh, obviously, we have seen all those uh, uh, videos of, of some people uh, so inclined in other parts of the world. But um, there are, for example, for, for, for those of the Muslim faith, there are, there are many uh, uh, Quranic, inju there are Quranic injunctions as well as many uh, hadiths uh, which, which actually uh, enjoin followers to, 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 uh, to, to take precautionary measures. Um, the very word quarantine comes from the word, it comes from the Italian, and it comes from the, which comes in turn from the Arabic. Uh, you know uh, the the, the Arab, Arbaia, Arbaia was the Arabic term which was then adopted by in Venice uh, as quarantina and then uh, came into the English language to uh, 
That's interesting. Um, can, can I just take you back to um, back uh, to, to the issue of, say, Malaysia and exit strategies? Um, we, we have a question in from uh, Jimmy, who says, um, "What's your opinion on the government's decision to ease up the MCO and allow manufacturing, construction, and machinery sectors to operate right now? Uh, do you think that makes sense? That's what Donald Trump's talking about as well." I do think that we, whether it's done right now or done later. Um, this has to be this has to done, be done. Uh, the economy cannot be shut down forever until you la you, you you get rid of the last uh, case of infection. That's not feasible at all. So the question is 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 when we make this transition back. The problem I find is that we do not have enough of an all of government approach, and we do not have a whole of society approach. Yeah, all of society has to better understand what's what's at stake. All of government approach basically means that we need to have changes in public transportation. We need to have changes in education. We need to have changes in 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 the, in human resources and so on. So, for example, many um, uh, 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 factories can be required to 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 uh, to try to enforce uh, to introduce physical distancing, and and uh, there should be checks of at workplaces to ensure that physical distancing becomes a feature of, of uh, many of these uh, workplaces. So in, in circumstances, I think it is really, um, sooner or later, we have to get back to, to, to work. Um, uh, the economy is not going to, to just chug along uh, on basis of goodwill and sunshine. And, and so, um, and that basically and, uh, requires us to, so we've already had a, a month of the lockdown and there's been very little discussion about how the workplace is going to change, how work relations are going to change, how interactions among human beings uh, in this country, let alone in other countries, will change. And here we can, have, we can learn a great deal from practices elsewhere, whether we need to dis, uh, stand uh, uh, two, two, two meters away from one another or, or, or a meter from one another, uh, whether, uh, uh, what, whether masks can be, can be recycled, can be washed. In a post society like Kerala, people are using old saris, rags, to cover, the, and, and you have a very low rate of infection. So I think it's important for us to be very practical and pragmatic about this and prepare the popula population, including and require the managements and, and others uh, and local authorities, for example, to, 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 to uh, accelerate this transition. It's, it's interesting you say that because it's obviously not just an economic, it's a, it's a, it's a social, it's a political, it's a medical um, uh, issue, even a technological issue. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of upsides of, of, of this uh, MCO, depending on what sector of work you're in, of course. I think for teachers, it's been a huge boon um, having to kind of rely on the technology that's been there for 10 years, for 20 years. It's forced us to kind of... Um, uh, access it and, and use it. Um, I have a question from Adhura, uh, who says, uh, curious to know, what are your thoughts on Malaysia's political instability and to what extent did that hinder early action and to what extent are political considerations in charge of the decision of when we are going to actually all get back to normal? Uh, how do you think that's affected us? Um, let me let me uh, deal with the, the the previous government as well as with the current government. The um, the previous government had committed itself itself to uh, a year of tourism promotion, uh, the, and it saw the tourism promotion as something to be to be committed to. And uh, when the first uh, inform news of the uh, of the uh, epidemic uh, uh, came out. Um, the previous government uh, remained committed to uh, opening its the doors uh, to uh, to uh, tourists from all over, uh, including China. Uh, China, after all, is the largest source of tourists visiting Malaysia. Uh, however, uh, by uh, early uh, February, uh, it changed its view on this. Uh, I should also emphasize that the Ministry of Health was particularly uh, uh, had already begun to talk about testing. Uh, on the 3rd of, of January uh, this year. So we were really quick off the blocks, okay? Slightly lower with, with, the, with, the, with the rethinking the tourism promotion, but not too late. Uh, when, when the idea of a supplementary budget came up, 
um, uh, in, 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 in February. Uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister uh, Tun Mahathir insisted on accelerating the supplementary budget. He wanted to have it released in the month of February itself rather than wait until March. So when the, uh, well, for want of a better term, the palace coup took place, uh, we lost arguably around three weeks. Uh, we lost uh, uh, because of the, of the, of the, of the uncertainty and, uh, and the lack of, of leadership and more, most importantly, uh, the lack of, of uh, the supplementary uh, resources which were badly needed to, to purchase protective equipment, to, protect, uh, to purchase the testing equipment and, and uh, testing supplies and so on and so forth. So we lost about three weeks there at a possibly the worst possible time in terms of what was happening in the world. Uh, so I think whatever advantage we had from early action uh, in January and, and, uh, and February was largely lost during those three weeks. Now, this problem has been exacerbated by the um, by the demonstrated uh, uh, lack of competence of the of some of the ministers involved. Fortunately, the prime minister, uh, the, uh, Prime Minister Mayudin, has been uh, has recognized the gravity of the problem and has worked very closely uh, with the uh, Director General of the Ministry of Health uh, to try to get the grips with the problem. However, as I suggested earlier, this is a more general problem. The problem is not simply a problem of public health or a problem of policing. We need to do much, much more uh, in terms of ensuring, for example, that during this lockdown period, much more was done in terms, not only in terms of testing, but also in terms of tracing, in terms of isolation, in terms of uh, treat, treatment. And, not the, the, the evidence on this is a little less clear. And particularly with tracing, I already raised the problem of public, but I suspect that there are other problems of tracing. In addition, we have a serious problem in that we have almost 30% uh, uh, of the labor force in Malaysia consists of foreign workers. And out of the almost 7 million foreign workers who are in the country, uh, about 5 million uh, uh, undocumented. So we have almost very little clue as to where they are. And then the wrong signal being sent by suggesting that the, the foreign workers would be charged for the test. And these tests are very expensive. Yeah. Um, deterred uh, many foreign workers. So although that that uh, statement has been withdrawn, uh, there are, and, and as we can see in the case of Singapore, unless you positively incentivize uh, the, these uh, sort of undocumented workers to come forward uh, if they suspect that they are infected, there's going to be very little interest in doing so. And, yeah. and haven't, we seen, sorry, haven't we seen the same thing? I mean, you mentioned right at the start, you know, the resurgence in Singapore is due to primarily um, uh, South Asian workers there who are sleeping in bunk beds into a room. But the same, exactly the same thing applies here, perhaps even to a greater extent. Um, do you think that in Malaysia we could see a kind of a spike again pushed by that 30% foreign labour? Um, I hope not. I hope not. But it's difficult to tell. We just don't know. You see, um, I think generally speaking, um, uh, most of the infections um, can be presumed to have come from abroad, right? The initial inf infection at least. And spreads within the population. Insofar as there is uh, a certain social distance, if you will, between yeah. relations and foreign workers, uh, perhaps foreign workers, especially those in agriculture and construction and so on, really have very little uh, contact with people who are likely to be infected. Uh, it is more likely that service workers who are, are more likely to come in contact with people who are infected, especially urban service workers in the major metropolises. So I am, I am concerned that there are infections, but I hope, and maybe this is wishful thinking on my part, that we do not have a Singapore-like problem uh, on our hands here in Malaysia. Yeah, inshallah. Um, uh, another question. Uh, this is in from E. Finn. Um, uh, and uh, he, she um, is asking, um, do you feel that the assistance given to businesses to get through the MCO are sufficient 
Um, do you think there are any other initiatives that could potentially work? Um, I, I don't know about giving uh, loans or tax exemptions and so on, um, but some countries have committed huge sums of money, uh, supposedly. I saw France today, 102 billion euro. Um, do, do you think Malaysia has done enough to support that kind of um, vital sector of the economy? Um, I think it is extremely difficult to in a in in a situation of great uncertainty uh, to to design um, to design um, uh, you know uh, support uh, in order to reach the most um, the, the, the 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 deserving. But what who are the deserving? And I would argue that the deserving are hardly the big businesses which 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 was which which uh, was were referred to in the question. Uh, the the most deserving are th are those who are involved in really petty businesses and so on and so forth. They are barely eking out a, a, a livelihood in, in, in the present circumstances. And I'm terribly concerned about what is likely to, to happen to them. Now, this is not as bad as in poorer societies, and, and, and we can be grateful for that. But as far as industries, as, as far as bigger businesses are concerned, there are difficult choices to be made. I think it would be fair to say that the travel business, for example, is going to take a hit, which is not going to go away after the lockdown is over. Yeah. Travel business is going to be uh, damaged for uh, not months, I would suspect, uh, for years to come. Uh, so do we want to bail out uh, the airline industries, for example? Uh, do we want to bail out the hotel industries? Uh, when there are very few pr prospects of the hotel industry uh, reaching uh, a high level of occupancy, uh, even after the, the lockdown is over and even after half a year is, goes by. So I think we really need to begin to think about uh, what, um, you know, what, what, what uh, life is going to be like. Yeah. And that that's why the you know the, the title of today's session is talks about going to towards the new normal what is the new normal going to be and we we need to begin to think about this now environmentalists are already celebrating the fact that we actually have cleaner air we have less nitrogen dioxide in the air and uh, less uh, toxic uh, materials in the air and so on and so forth uh, but um, per, perhaps this we we can we should try to begin to think about uh, uh, moving towards a, 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 a lifestyles where uh, perhaps consumption, consumptions of, of goods and services, um, uh, perhaps is not given the kind of importance and not uh, which which it tends to be given by by the nature, very nature of economic statistics. Economic statistics uh, are biased towards uh, privileging those kinds of things. So. We Capitalism is based on this, isn't it, Prof? I mean, without, I mean, can, can you envisage a world? Um, I mean, I think a lot of environmentalists and uh, even people like me would be quite happy with a world with minimal growth. I mean, this obsession with this obsession with four, five, six, seven percent growth, um, fueling consumerism, fueling environmental disaster. Perhaps COVID has slowed everything down. Do you think that's a positive? Well, these are very difficult decisions, and we know who are, have the who has the ear of, you know, what kinds of people have the ear of most governments, and so it's very unlikely that 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 this kind of vi uh, greener vision of uh, of the new normal, uh, which you are suggesting, is going to prevail. But I suspect that you know we're, we're not going to be able to go back to 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 the uh, business as usual. Uh, we have to recognize that, so that we have unexpectedly, a chance to rethink our futures. We have a chance to rethink what is important to us in life. And so I think if we cast it in that fashion and we begin to think of, of, uh, of, of some of these more fundamental questions in life and begin to give incentives for that. For example, if you have a transition, you know, Malaysia, when, when licenses were given to the inter, in, independent power producers uh, th three decades ago. They were mainly given to diesel, uh, people producing uh, electricity from, from diesel. Uh, today, most of them are using coal, okay? 
And most of them are not using what uh, Mr. Trump would call clean coal. Dirty <laughs> coal. Okay. Yeah. Now, Beautiful. we have a chance now. We have a chance now to accelerate the transition uh, to renewable energy uh, using uh, solar panels. And we have abundant supply of sunshine in this country, if nothing else. We also have uh, the possibility of moving increasingly to biodiesel. Okay. Right. Bi and, and that is much cheaper than almost all other sources of, of, uh, of uh, all other sources of, uh, of uh, uh, vegetable-based uh, uh, biofuels. Yeah, I so, mean, on that on that subject, I mean, um, I got another question popped up uh, in front of me for again from uh, Wong Yi Finn, um, who says that um, you know we had SARS, we had Zika. We had Ebola, although of course that only affected Africa, so why would the world worry about it? Um, uh, do you think that this risk of pandemics that a lot of people have been complaining about or forecasting, Bill Gates famously five years ago issued exactly the warning that we should have uh, listened to, um, it's going to continue to threaten economic growth. Um, do you see countries building kind of pandemic resilient economies? That's the question, you think. Uh, how yeah. are countries that are pandemic resilient, if not resistant? You know, um, I, I'm not a great fan of, of uh, Mrs. Thatcher, the late Mrs. Thatcher, but, you know, she was one of the few early world leaders in the 1980s who, who warned about the problems of global warming. She's the uh, only one with a science degree, right? Well, chemistry, actually, to be to be more precise. So she had a greater sensitivity, perhaps, uh, to 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 the issues involving global warming. Uh, Jimmy Carter had raised that issue, but he it was not he didn't really pursue it. Now we have in the in the form of the last three U.S. presidents, uh, beginning with Clinton, George W. Bush, and 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 then uh, Barack Obama, also highlighting the the problems of uh, epidemics and pandemics. Uh, uh, that for those who have a historical sense, the Spanish flu of, of 1918, um, the bubonic plague, the plague in Manchuria, in uh, where where uh, uh, Dr. Wu Liante, uh, Penang, uh, Penang doctor, uh, really made his uh, made a, a major made a huge impression. All these uh, were extremely important in in terms of. Uh, they, they were they were quite prophetic, and together, and you mentioned uh, Bill Gates as well. Now these are real problems, uh, but unfortunately, the the very nature of electoral politics, the short termist nature of electoral politics, do not lend themselves to uh, political leaders uh, thinking about these longer term problems. Fortunately, we live in the part of the world where many of the recent uh, uh, viral uh, epidemics uh, have come from. Uh, we all uh, Malaysians so uh, were, were trying to get uh, the the Nipah virus uh, named after the Nipah, and and uh, together with that, there were a number of other epidemics, except for Ebola uh, and perhaps one other. Uh, they they were largely uh, said to have come from this part of the world uh, and and transmitted by bat species. Although there is a great deal of controversy of whether pangolins, uh, anteaters are, are more significant than than bats uh, in this particular case. But in any case, I think what is significant about uh, uh, COVID-19 is that it is aerosol born. Uh, the, 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 the protein, uh, um, the, the, the virus is, bo is born by aerosols. In other words, uh, it, it is airborne, not, not in the, uh, the uh, as, uh, as uh, Barack Obama and others have pointed out, the worst possible scenario, which is, is something which is completely airborne. Okay, in this case, the fact that it is aerosol means that it can it can carry up to a certain distance and not not much more. And it's not even clear whether it is infectious at uh, at that. just because something can be can go up to about doesn't necessarily mean it's still infectious after. Uh, right. after in that distance. So there are many things which are still not very clear about the science of this. And I'm no great, I'm no, certainly no scientist and, and, and I'm trying to learn as much as everybody else is to learn about this crisis. But I think what, it is a real problem. It is a real problem. And the, 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 the frequency, increase 
the frequency with which uh, such viral epidemics have, have occurred in the recent period uh, must surely be a cause of concern for all. Sure. I mean, I don't think anybody um, really quite understands the epidemiology of it yet. I'm sure in weeks to come, the numbers will continue to change. But just to bring you back um, again to the Malaysian economy, which I think a lot of our uh, listeners will be interested in, um, what do you see as being the big, um, the, the major impact as far as Malaysia is concerned? Because I, I saw some figures saying next year we're looking at five, six percent growth again. Uh, what, what numbers do you think Malaysians should be looking at? Is it unemployment? Is it growth? Is it the, is it the stock market? Um, what 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 are your forecasts on on uh, on that? I think you're better off being a fortune teller. <laughs> I, I I would I, I would I mean I have seen how numbers have changed in days and weeks, uh, you know, uh, over the last few months, and uh, you know, um, uh, I think uh, th this forces any economists and particularly those involved in forecasting. To be extremely humble about what they think they know, so I, I would not, uh, I will not uh, um, be seduced by your question, right? <laughs> but I, I thought I thought economists were were kind of you know fortune tellers with degrees uh, or fortune tellers who understood the maths. Presumably, there must be there must be numbers there that are indicative of of what's going to happen. Yes, I, 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 I used to joke that uh, economists are astrologers with the, with with the PhDs. Yes. Right, okay. So, so you're not committing yourself to that. Um, uh, so, if, if just very quickly on Malaysia, because I've got a few questions here on the. Um, I'm looking at the uh, at the feed, um, and there, uh, and people seem to be interested in how do you think, or how do you realistically think that. Um, People in Malaysia, ordinary people in Malaysia, how are their lives going to be altered by this? Because I, I, from my point of view, I, I think in a few months' time, we're going to look back and think that it was massively overstated. Now, that's perhaps uh, slightly mm. heretical to say that. Um, you know, I, I don't think the numbers are going to be quite as bad as, certainly not as Spanish flu or the bubonic plague, which completely and fundamentally restructured societies. That, that, we're not seriously looking at something like that, do you think? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, I think, uh, Mark, that's a, a, a dangerous thing to, for you to say. Uh, the, I, I want to emphasize once again that the, there is uh, no, re, no back, we're not going to back to business as usual. This is not like any of the recent, recent uh, financial crisis where we go back to business as usual after the immediate uh, after immediate addressing the immediate fall in aggregate demand or whatever the, the problem might be uh, what we are talking about is uh, uh, what people like to call a new normal I'm not sure that th there's going to be a single new normal there are going to be many many uh, new normals and I'm not normal in the sense that they're going to be constantly works in progress they're constantly going to have to evolve uh, not only in, in response to, to new challenges uh, but also um, uh, in terms of, of trying to adjust uh, increasingly to life where physical distancing uh, becomes a social uh, very essential part of life and how do we rethink for example how do we I don't like the term social distancing because the social distancing implies all kinds of things. In India, it implies the caste system. In other societies, it harkens nice. back to colonialism and so on and so forth. I don't know apartheid and so on. But I think what is very important is for that we have to recognize the importance of physical distancing, of precautionary measures. And, and, that, and the, 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 that responsibility of all of us uh, basically means that, um, that life as we have known it has to fundamentally change. And it's very difficult for me to, to, to actually think about what it implies. Uh, I remember I had been in self-isolation because I had been to, to, to Korea uh, um, uh, at the time and there was somebody in the hotel who, who had been infected uh, and, uh, before I got into the hotel. But just to be on the safe side, I was very, very cautious uh, after coming back. And after that, when I met anybody, I refused to shake hands. And, you know, it's, it was so 
and a theme, you know, I, I was seen as almost being a snob for not wanting to. Whereas I was actually concerned about about possibly being infectious uh, because we at that time those were the early days. We were talking about the second week of February. We didn't know how long it would take uh, uh, to 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 tr transmit and, and uh, uh, you know how, how long would, uh, one could remain infectious in, in those days. Even yeah. now, now, certain about it. Yeah. I say we're all operating in a kind of a haze of uh, of, of miscomprehension. I mean, that, that's, I think, what's puzzling a lot of people. So um, I don't want to summarize your uh, take, but your take is a fairly depressing one uh, if, you, if you believe that there will be, uh, that the new normal will be very, very different from the old normal. Uh, am, I, am I fair in summarizing your general view as that? Yes, I think you're absolutely correct that we will have to ch fundamentally change our the way of life. I mean, for just imagine for 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 people who are used to uh, the Italians, for for Arabs, uh, you know, who are used to kissing each other on their cheeks and so on and so forth, mm. times a day and so on. I mean, it's a fundamental change in lifestyle, in the way we live. Um, you know, uh, the idea of not going back uh, uh, during Hari Raya to see your grandparents and and and, and you know and to hug them and to, you know. Uh, the, all this will have to fundamentally change if we do not want to put one another at risk. And, and this is not easy to internalize. This is why I'm, I'm very concerned that while, uh, you know, while we might debate about whether or not the extension of the lockdown has been necessary and so on and so forth, not enough is being done to educate people about the, the dangers they face, what kinds of precautionary measures are needed, and how all will affect the way we interact with one another in the future. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, way to conclude. I mean, may maybe just one final point, because I I'm again looking at the stream, uh, and a couple of the questions have come in. One, um, I don't know if this is from Emma, but via Geographia Media. Um, uh, the, 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 the question is, um, the, 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 the impact is going to be on very, different but diverse sectors of people. Um, so at the moment, uh, people in professional jobs don't seem to be that badly affected. But I know a lot of people are very worried about social instability resulting, resulting from, you know, uh, unemployment back to a 1920s situation. Um, what role do you think government has, um, specifically in terms of Malaysia, in mitigating all of this. Uh, does Malaysia have the resources, does Malaysia have the funds to actually uh, help a, a very significant portion of people out? Uh, year, years ago, looking at the, at the UN, I, I, I uh, basically tried to promote uh, the idea of, uh, of, uh, of having every child uh, including primary school children, uh, to ensure that they had computers. Uh, and the UN was involved in a project where we were trying to build uh, a $50, uh, 50 US dollars uh, computer. And we succeeded in doing so. Um, mm -hmm. We had it in the, in the UN languages, in Chinese, in, in Arabic, uh, as well as the European languages. And uh, unfortunately, the, the take-up rate was very, very low. The countries which uh, adopted this were countries like Libya and China and 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 and, and so on. Um, many of the major countries did not take it up. But the, the the interesting thing about these computers was that they were quite robust. They were built to to be dropped from up to three uh, of, of a meter high. Right. Uh, so you 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 are, you are throwing your computer <laughs> against the wall. Uh, it would it would survive a drop. And the whole idea was to be able to to enable uh, you know uh, computerized learning uh, for for all children. Uh, and uh, so you talked earlier about distance learning, and at at the tertiary level, I think everybody has adjusted to that. Uh, but 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 uh, for the primary and secondary school level, um, they, they, it's still a long way away, especially for a country like Malaysia. Yeah. And so how we go about doing that is going to be uh, very, very challenging, I think. Uh, it's not that we don't have the means. It's not terribly expensive uh, if you're talking about uh, a, a 200 ringgit computer. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, you have to have the political will. The prioritization has to be there. And I've struggled for years, for example, to try to change, to improve nutrition at school level uh, in all uh, the schools uh, with, with uh, very little to show for it. Uh, yeah. The Ministry of Education of Health has actually come up with very, very uh, low cost uh, uh, dietary options, which are very healthy. Uh, but the Ministry of Education has not adopted them. Uh, yeah. So we don't have these sort of, you know, uh, um, gaps between ministry and ministerial cooperation is a problem, not only in this country, but in many other countries as, as well. So we, there, there's a lot which we need to do and we need to do better. But the very nature of politics in this country, uh, unfortunately, does not lend itself to public policy improvements. Uh, you know. You, you, you maybe don't want to answer this, but um, do you think that uh, maybe COVID came at a rather opportune time for the new government, uh, that everybody is reserving judgment, nobody's really thinking about politics right now? Um, I, I, it's very difficult. To, I, I'm not trying to evade your question. I, I really thought about it very carefully, but I've already made some comments earlier about how poorly this uh, new government has fared so you know it's you know with with about almost 80 uh, members of parliament in the executive and uh, another 20 being made uh, chair chairs of uh, government linked companies and so on there are about a dozen people short of the of making sure everybody uh, uh, that they, they have a majority uh, for, for for the parliamentary vote but leaving that aside I, i'm just there is a fundamental problem, uh, not only in Malaysia, but how do we, how do we ensure that the political system lends itself to better public policy making? That is a fundamental problem, and in Malaysia, the problem is exacerbated by ethno populism. And ethno populism is now rife throughout the world. You have it in India, you have it in in, in Brazil, and you have it in the United. States, you have it uh, in different parts of Europe, and so on and so forth. So it is yeah. so all problems which conspire against the improvement of the human condition uh, through public policy. Yeah. Well, on that very cheery note, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I can see that our, our time is up. We're just over uh, the, the nine o'clock. Um, I'm going to ask Emma to come back in, and um, I think she's going to uh, finish up with a few words. I, there may be one or two questions. I apologize to uh, viewers if I, if I missed your question. Uh, JJ uh, and Adhura, I can see questions from you, and yeah. um, Adam uh, Harmine. Um, but I think, and Chaco as well, I can see Chaco Vadikev on there. But I think actually you address most of those questions um, uh, in your replies anyway. So, um, Jomo, Dr. Jomo, thank you very much for your time. Uh, over to you, Emma. Thank okay. you, Mark. Thank you, Emma. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, I was just looking at JJ Dennis's question um, about the future of jobs. And we have um, Chin Han Lim from Towers Watson lined up in a couple of weeks. So yeah, important question, and we'll be looking at that in a couple of weeks. So check out for your, your emails for the invite. Um, so big, big thank you um, to Prof Jomo for um, some interesting insights into this crisis. Thank you to Mark. Um, huge thank you to Sean Tan, who has been beavering away, setting up all this technology for our new society. He's been managing all of us who are culturally and technologically completely ignorant. So Paul Sean has been very patient. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I hope to see you all on Wednesday, eight o'clock, when we talk to our two um, Sunway Medical Center doctors. So finally, Paul Jomo, thank you very much for joining us on our first webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Doc. Stay safe. Yes, Yeah, thank you. Wash your hands. It'll all be over in a week. Don't worry. <laughs>